really. If I touch you, it's, and you die, it's not because I touch you. <laughs> We're all gonna die. This is a branding iron. Okay, it's a very small branding iron. This is actually designed to heat up and use on your steak just before you serve it. Now, we all know here in the Wild West that a century or more ago, ranchers would brand their cattle. Why would you brand your cattle? So, so you know which is your cattle out in the field, exactly. It makes you outstanding in your field. <laughs> so we are going to learn about the art of branding yourself tonight. I became the doyen of death uh, only about six years ago. I come from a background as a public relations professional and an event planner. And I went back to Washington, D.C., where I'm from, for my 40th high school reunion last this past weekend. And I'm telling people now, I'm a deaf educator. That's deaf, not deaf. <laughs> Somebody actually started flashing sign language at me, and I was like, uh, no comprende. But I got into this business in 2000. I got married for the second time and had a really creative Jewish Western wedding. And everybody had such a good time, I wanted to write a book about creative life cycle events and call it Matchings, Hatchings, and Dispatchings. <laughs> about weddings and births and deaths. And got to write a column in the Albuquerque Tribune by that name, a monthly feature. And it was the columns on death and funerals that got the most reader response. And it told me there's a real need to be able to have this conversation. So, and there are plenty of creative wedding planning books. We don't need another one of those, but there weren't very many, if any, books on creative funeral planning. So I focused on funerals and a good goodbye funeral planning for those who don't plan to die was the result. And it changed the course of my career. I became a certified thanatologist, which is a death educator, a funeral celebrant, an author, a speaker, a journalist. I contribute articles to funeral trade magazines, but we'll talk about that as part of your branding a little later in the presentation. Is that light on on the speaker? Okay. And I was a producer at C-SPAN before I was a public relations professional. So I started using video, and you, if you go to my website, agoodgoodbye.com, you'll see part of my story on my website. Hi, I'm Gail Rubin. My business is a good goodbye, end of life planning for those who don't plan to die. I'm a certified thanatologist. That's a fancy name for a deaf educator. That's deaf, not deaf. The problem with this line of work is most people won't admit we're all going to die. So I use humor and funny films in my talks to attract people and break down resistance to talking about end-of-life issues, estate planning, funeral planning, how to have a good conversation with your doctor, things like that. This journey started back in college, where I majored in communications and film. In one class, I did a satire of Ingmar Bergman's classic film, The Seventh Seal, the scene where death comes for a medieval knight, and the knight challenges death to a game of chess. Little did I know I would be making fun of death all these years later as a profession. I wrote an award-winning book called The Good Goodbye, Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die, host a television interview series, and an internet radio program. You can also hear my Mortality Minute radio spots in a number of markets. Let's face it, funerals are the parties no one wants to plan. If people plan their weddings the way most people plan their funerals, they'd be scrambling to pull everything together in a week. Talk about stress! It doesn't have to be that way. By having conversations and planning ahead, families can reduce stress and conflict, save money, and have a meaningful, memorable good goodbye. 
it is an idea whose time has come. Talking about sex won't make you pregnant. Talking about funerals won't make you dead. Let's start a conversation today. And by the way, the guy who's deaf, that, that's my first husband. <laughs> Find out what Susan's story is. Too far ahead. That's not me. I started out as a scientist. And then, when I couldn't get a job as a scientist because of a glutted job market, an engineer. And I worked as an environmental engineer for a number of years. As a scientist and an engineer, I had done a lot of writing. But it's not anything that any of you would care to read. <laughs> Unless you're really warped and really want to know something about the effects of cold acclimation upon glucose 6-phosphatase activity in two species of free-living nematodes. <laughs> it's good bedtime reading. <laughs> not much else. At any rate, most of my writing has come to me. And as a result, I don't have any clear brand. But people know me for mold. mold. And hopefully, eventually, people will know me about football. football. Yes. But my earlier writing, outside of technical writing, I wrote about art for the Pastel Journal, having discovered an artistic side of me when I turned 50. How cool is that? That's cool. I, thank you. I started writing articles for prime time about local restaurants. Art, restaurants, nice. The third thing I started to write about was for a job. I, worked for a while at the Board of Realtors here, here in Albuquerque. And it was part of my function as education coordinator to write two blurbs every two weeks for the local real estate magazine. So I wrote about things that were real estate oriented, even though I knew absolutely nothing about real estate. And of course, at some point, I wrote about Oh, yes! <laughs> Funny how that keeps coming back. Realtors were panicked. They did not know what to do. They were terrified at the concept of black mold or toxic mold. With some reason. Because realtors were being sued left and right along with insurance companies. Because that's when I was working for the board. I decided, this is stupid, we need a book. So I called Kaplan Dearborn and told him that I had been, actually I had developed a course with one of my other instructors who did know something about real estate. He talked about real estate, I talked about the science of mold. And when I talked to this guy at Kaplan Dearborn, he said, let me have you talk to the editor-in-chief. Now, calling somebody cold like this is not something I do. But I was tired of making zillions of handouts for the students taking our mold class, because this was my responsibility, to make sure the students had all the class materials they needed. So at any rate, I talked to the editor-in-chief and I gave him my sort of my credentials and all of this. He said, you know, this is very interesting because just last week we were talking about the need for a book about mold. mold. <laughs> yes. Oh man, you guys are good. <laughs> at any rate, I have published an addition to those magazine articles. I published my book about mold, my book about football, football facts for females, or if you can't beat them, join them. And Randy and I just finished the first draft of a novel, Moment of Death. He is a sculptor. Moment of Death is about 
a sculptor. <laughs> Probably <laughs> one you don't want to meet. <laughs> and do you want to tell the story about football effects for females? Oh, yes. Yes, that would be good. So why did I write a book about football? Do I look like an NFL player? <laughs> That's true. That's true. I knew very little about it, even though I was born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And if you're born and raised in Milwaukee, you have to love the Packers, or they kick you out. <laughs> loving the Packers goes along with loving sausages and cheese and beer. Yes, even better than mold. <laughs> At any rate, Randy and I have always had a good relationship, but it wasn't quite so good during football season because he would be glued to the TV set. And I'd be just doing my thing and wondering where he was and who he was. <laughs> I decided since he had learned a lot about classical music from me in our early days, he'd take me to concerts and things like this, and he started learning about music. I decided if he could learn about music for me, why couldn't I learn about football for him? Now, this was in the days before the internet, so it wasn't easy peasy. It meant a lot of library work and reading books and magazines and newspapers. And I was finally kind of getting the hang of it. We talked about football a lot, and it did improve our relationship. So it was even better than it had been before. But I got to thinking how many other women could use a book like this so that instead of migrating into the kitchen or going off shopping, they could sit and watch the game with their spouses and have a good time doing it. It certainly worked for me. So with that, with that, let's talk about some branding. That sounds like a good plan. <laughs> I'm sorry the red doesn't show up very well, but what that says is, how do I identify a target market? <laughs> and your target market. Hold that. Yes, well, I was choking. Okay, don't choke. <laughs> your target market, market, regardless of what you may think about your book, is not everybody. Even Gail's target market is not everybody. Even though everybody will die, <laughs> I, I target my marketing toward baby boomers and seniors concerned about end-of-life issues. You know, I could try and target 18-year-olds, but they think they're immortal. So, but do know that 18 years old, you are legally responsible for yourself, and it's a good idea to have a will and to have your advanced medical directives written down. But I'm not going to waste my time trying to convince the college crowd of doing that, at least not at this point. <laughs> really? So even though my target market could virtually be almost anybody, after all, Joe Theismann read my book after being a quarterback with the Redskins for 14 years. Yay, Redskins! Yay! And learned something about football from my book. Everybody is not my target market either. It's more likely women between 30 and 50 or 60, and anybody who wants to refresh their, their knowledge of football. I've got strategy in there, I've got a glossary. There is humor in my football book, which I could not put in my mold book. <laughs> oh. The mold can't be funny. Yeah, so um, just a little poll here. Who writes nonfiction? And who writes nonfiction? Okay, wait a minute. That doesn't add up. <laughs> who writes nonfiction? And who writes fiction? Who's writing fiction? That's why, because I didn't ask the right question. Okay. You can do branding for your fiction. It's uh, definitely easier to identify your audience for nonfiction, 
But even if you're writing science fiction, you're writing bodice rippers, you're writing historical fiction, you're writing memoirs. Well, I guess that would be nonfiction, right? <laughs> Unless you're making some stuff up. But you need to think about who is going to read this? Who is going to love this? Who's going to benefit from what I have to say? And like Kit, I think you, you, know, you have discovered who your market is. It's, it's the greatest generation men who were involved in the war. So think about who you are writing for in, while you're writing it before you get to the point where you're, I've got this book and, and maybe it's not quite as targeted as it could be. And True, yes. And here's how you target. And here's how you target, obviously by gender. Especially, not, not so much for Gail because men and women die in equal amounts, I would guess. <laughs> yes, but the men die sooner. Yes, the men, yes. So the women have to do the planning. That's true. <laughs> and age can be a factor, particularly with dying. Location. Now this is particularly applicable for me because I would anticipate that football facts for females would do better in cities with an NFL team. I just haven't made it there yet. <laughs> We don't have an NFL team in Albuquerque. We have to rely on the Denver Broncos or the Dallas Cowboys or the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> Yay! Interests. Interests. And economics. You may want to talk about economics. Well, can people buy your product? Okay, a $15, $20 book, most people can shell out for that. If they can't, they are not your prospects. <laughs> but when you start talking about using your brand to make money beyond your book, really, and we'll get to this later in this talk, that is when economics will make a difference. If you're just wanting to get a reader for your book, well, certainly you want to write another book and have them buy that book. And then you want to perhaps, if you're building a business based on your brand, some of the other things that I offer, not just the funeral planning for those who don't plan to die book, but I'm a certified funeral celebrant. It costs a lot more to hire me as a funeral celebrant than to buy a copy of my book. But you do get a lot more service when you hire me to do that. And this is one of the ways that you can further develop what you're writing about and what you're speaking about and working toward making a living with your writing and your speaking. Make sense? Capiche? Okay. Capiche. Anything else you want to add to that? I don't think so. So what's your unique selling proposition? And your unique selling proposition, this describes your brand. And there are so many brands out there that are really well known. Like, where's the meat? Beef. Where's the, Where's the beef? <laughs> Where's the beef? Who says that? Wendy's. Wendy's. Yes. Just do it. Just do it. Yes. Nike. Is that Nike? Nike, but I also sign my uh, kicking the bucket list book, Just Do It. <laughs> Downsizing. One that I really like is the dog kids love to bite. <laughs> I think that's armor, <laughs> armor hot dog, and melt in your mouth, none in your hands, M&M's, what's in your wallet? <laughs> yeah. It keeps going and going and going, and you just see the Energizer Bunny. If you can come up with a unique selling proposition like that, 
you've got it made for a brand. <coughs> also, your unique selling proposition should be able to say in one sentence, hopefully in one breath, what you're all about and why somebody would want what you have. For instance, my unique selling proposition is I work with organizations that want to connect with and sell to baby boomers concerned about end-of-life issues. I didn't time that, but I think it's less than seven seconds. You want to be able to describe what you're doing and why somebody would want what you are offering in that way. Mine for my football book is you can improve your relationship with your favorite football fan. Yay, that's, that's good. Pretty close to seven. I don't have one for mold. <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if you've got mold, you've got a problem. Everybody's got mold, so everybody's got a problem. And, and your book solves that problem. Well, it helps. Yes. <laughs> you also need, no matter what your unique selling proposition is, you need to be clear and you need to be authentic. You must come across as yourself, not try to emulate somebody else. Yes? Do you think they'll uh, put the fun back in fungus like that? <laughs> they should, <laughs> because fungus is indeed fun and funny. <laughs> Only if your well, parents are mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Yes. Well, I put the fun in funeral planning. You did. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let us talk about living your brand. That's my that my Billy Whip. Yes. Okay. So many of you have seen me at many Southwest Writers meetings with my skull shirt. Yay! I love this shirt. But I have other skull stuff. I have a skull belt. I wear Lucchese boots with skulls and roses that go with it. I wear my brand and I get noticed when I walk around at funeral director conventions. In fact, this ad is from a ad agency in Los Angeles called L LA Ads Marketing that specializes in marketing for funeral homes. And they noticed me walking around a few years ago in my outfit, and they decided to start wearing bright red shoes to make them stand out from the crowd. And this was an email that they just sent to all of their funeral director friends saying, we're going to be at the NFDA, the National Funeral Directors Association Convention in Philadelphia. So look for us and talk to us about how we can make you stand out from the crowd. And they told me, face to face, the reason we started wearing red shoes is because we saw you walking around the convention wearing your skull stuff. So wearing what your brand is makes you stand out from the crowd, sets you apart, and makes you memorable. You should wear a leather bomber jacket when you go yeah, out. And I, I was told that. Yeah. You're the second or third part. Sam Newton said that. Take the hint. <laughs> yes. Tom, Tom Wolf is the for that. Oh, his white suit. Exactly. Exactly. So you could be writing fiction or memoir and, you know, wear something that makes you stand out. Who else has got some kind of idea about what they would wear for their brand? You have an idea. Well, yeah, I'll talk about your t-shirt. My t-shirt has four of the cartoons from my book. My illustrator, Diane Strongbow, fortunately understands football and she understands penalties and she did a bang up job. Would anybody quibble that this is unnecessarily <laughs> roughness? <laughs> If you can't see my shirt. This one. Pass 
interference. <laughs> Any ref who cannot make either of those calls does not deserve to wear a black and white shirt. I've got several of those in my book and they make me laugh all over again when I look at them. Well, let's talk about marketing, printed materials. Now, uh, you, sir, with the, what was the drink? Scoby? Scoob. Scoob. So you've got all sorts of marketing materials. You've got your, your bookmarks, you've got your t-shirts, you got your Scoob thing going on as well as, you know, your book. So part of branding is printed materials. Now on your tables, I have put some examples of marketing materials from my brand. This is a postcard for kicking the bucket list, 100 downsizing and organizing things to do before you die. If, if there aren't enough on each table and you want to take one home, I've got more over here. Over by Lola, by the way, I didn't mention Lola is one of the things that I've done is I am a pioneer of the Death Cafe movement here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And Lola, the plastic skeleton, is a, my mascot for the Albuquerque Death Cafe. It's an opportunity for people to get together and talk about what's on their hearts and their minds about mortality issues while having a cup of tea, some cookies, something a little nosh, and no agenda. But it's so rare in our society to be able to have an honest conversation about whatever concerns you about mortality issues. I, I have new people showing up all the time and I have I have regulars, too, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> so, postcards and bookmarks. Bookmarks are great for putting the title of your book and maybe part of the cover, but they're not formatted wide enough to get the whole piece of artwork on. And I, I prefer postcards because they're wide enough to put a lot of information on the back, as well as give you the entire book cover uh, on the other side of the postcard. If you are thinking about doing printed materials, I use an online outfit called Zoo Printing. Get really good prices on color printing from them. The shipping is actually more expensive than the printing. I got a thousand of these postcards for $53. <coughs> and a bigger chunk of it was the shipping to get the thousand postcards from wherever they printed it to my house. Can you say the place again? Zoo Printing, Z-O-O, -O, printing.com. You have to sign up with them as a client or a company, and they have to approve you. I actually referred a friend to them, and she said, they didn't approve me, so I don't know. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta be company-like when you approach them. There's this brochure, a trifold brochure, a good goodbye tips. Now this is another way to brand yourself. Now you could hand out information about yourself in your book, but why should somebody hold on to it? This trifold gives you money-saving tips on something that everybody's going to have to deal with at some point in their life. So people would tend to hold on to this. And then on the back, need help? And then it offers my services as a funeral planning consultant and a certified funeral celebrant. And letting people know I'm a licensed insurance agent if they wanted to buy final expense insurance. So this gives people more information about me and my brand, and it gives them a reason to hold on to it. So think about marketing pieces for yourself and your writing that might fit in to this kind of concept. Another concept, there are little drawing slips on your table. It says raffle prize giveaway form. And tonight, if you fill out that raffle prize form, and enter the drawing, you could win a copy of this TV series 
A good goodbye funeral planning for those who don't plan to die. It was a television interview program I did here locally, highly well produced, chock full of information, and it's a $50 value. So I hope you will enter the drawing, and now why would I ask you to do that? And by the way, extra incentive to fill out the email portion of the drawing slip, the Newly Dead game. This is a real game I created. It's like the Newly, no, did I say the Newly Wed game? You said Newly Dead. Okay, I said Newly Dead because that's the name of the game, but it's based on the Newly Wed game but the questions are how well you know your partner's last wishes. So all of this comes together in, when you send me your, include your email on that form, I will send you a link to download the PDF of this game and you can play it with your family and friends. Now all of this is designed to build your email list, which we will get to shortly. Did you want to add anything about printed materials? A couple things. Okay. I put out a couple of my bookmarks on the tables, not quite for the reason that Gail was talking about. I had my website and all that other marketing stuff developed after my book was published. So there's no place in my book for contact material. So each book gets a bookmark with my name and contact information. There is also something I wanted to say about banners. Gail does banners well. I have problems with mine. Yours fell down. Mine fell down. Yeah. I will show you. Oh, she's going to get her banner. You know, another part of materials is websites. And I don't think we did a separate slide about websites, but you need to have a website either your name or your book name. I would prefer your name. I actually have gailbrubin.com and I have a goodgoodbye.com. And she's got footballfactsforfemales.com. You want me to hold one in? Yes. With my picture. Look at that. Ooh. Nice banner, but very impractical. <laughs> For this type of environment at any rate. Yes. Don't get one this size. Get one. Go, go for the vertical that you can put your book cover art on. Right. Yeah. In fact, for um, uh, next week's National Funeral Directors Convention, because I contribute book reviews to Funeral Business Advisor, when Kicking the Bucket List came out, I said, hey, would you guys do a book review of Kicking the Bucket List? And they said, oh, why don't you just write your own book review and just write it in the third person? I said, okay, I'll do that. And, and it's going to be in the issue that's out during the convention. And then I had the brilliant idea of, well, I'm going to be there. Why don't they host a book signing for me at their booth at the convention? So I proposed that, and they said, Sure, that would be great. So Monday and Tuesday, I'm having a one-hour book signing as part of the expo, and they're making one of these stand-up banners like this one, but with the artwork for kicking the bucket list on it, and meet Gail Rubin. So these are the kind of things that you can build up, and that media coverage makes you outstanding in your field. Another thing about websites. Um, a good goodbye.com, football facts for females.com, gailrubin.com. Do you have a Susan Cooper dot no, com site? Not yet. Okay. There was something I wanted to say though. Okay. Become an expert in your field. We always hear write what you know. How much could you write if you were limited to writing what you know? <laughs> I would never have written a book about mold or a book about football. I was put in a position where I needed to learn something about both those topics. So I did. I made myself an expert and then confirmed my expert status by writing a book. That works. 
Yes. Being an author makes you an authority. Oh. It does. It does. You say, I wrote the book on the topic. Absolutely. By the way, I also wanted to mention cell sheets. I put one cell sheet on each table uh, about a good goodbye. This is something that publishers will want to see because it, it gives just a highlight of what your book's about and all the publisher information, the ISBN, the retail price, the distributors, etc., etc., and the little bio about the author. So think about having one of those for your book, for giving away and uh, promoting your books. For promoting yourself, I have two different, they're called one sheets, but they're actually two sheets because they're on both sides of one sheet. Uh, one is about presentations that I give. Funny films for funeral planning, talks about the newly dead game and other things with a little bio on the back. So as you build your brand and you've got different talks that you can do, you might want to do this kind of one sheet, two sheet thing. And then um, as my product line grew, I realized, well, I've got this t-shirt, you know, the all men and women are cremated equal t-shirt. <laughs> and I, I, made, I made these blank cards with a uh, photo that I took of a, it was actually a crypt gate of a hourglass with wings, and I made a very nice blank card set. So, you know, I call those time flies. By the way, I'm working on a new t-shirt. <laughs> The one who dies with the most toys still dies. <laughs> so this is like a product collection of, of the different things that I offer and then, and then a bigger bio on that. So that's something else you can consider putting together as your brand grows and you diversify. Okay, let's talk about speaking. Writers need to be speakers, and speakers need to be writers. As we mentioned, a book makes you an authority. And books don't talk. You have to get out there and talk on behalf of your book. The best way to learn to speak that I found was Toastmasters. Yay! <laughs> Gail and I are members of the same club, Albuquerque Challenge. You each have one of these flyers at your table. Challenge is having an open house on Saturday, October 29th. I know from 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock in the morning, but it's worth it. It should be a really good meeting. Randy and I are going to be doing a session on improv, and you will be also hearing a couple of really good speakers. These are kind of our typical meetings, although we don't always have a session on improv. But Randy and I sneak improv in as much as we can, because we love it. And we will be dressing up for Halloween. We will be dressing up, and there will be goodies. We don't always have goodies, but we will be a couple of really good speakers. These are kind of our typical meetings, although we don't always have a session on improv. But Randy and I sneak improv in as much as we can, because we love it. And we will be dressing up for Halloween. We will be dressing up, and there will be goodies. We don't always have goodies, but we will be having goodies. So I hope you come out for that. Learn how to be a good speaker and you can promote your book even better than before. Oh, Gail. Yes. One more thing. I have found personally that my biggest source of sales is when I'm giving a presentation about something, whether it be mold or football or something else. Because that way, you can reveal your authenticity. If anybody doesn't believe that I am truly into mold and football by now, 
I don't know what else to do. But it's the speaking. It's not so much the book signings, at least for me, that has been truly effective. So get out there and speak about your book. Yeah, do you mind? Um, I entertain when I have a book signing for the very and I'm a Toastmaster. Mm -hmm. So by golly, I have my spiel, I suck them right in, mm -hmm. and I sell my books. It's that speaking that really makes that connection. Right. So don't think you could write your book and just stay at home. Although you can market online. Certainly, uh, the online world has evolved to the point where you need to do that as well as speak. When I was writing A Good Goodbye, I actually blogged the book. I had actually written the book, but then I started putting it on the family plot blog .wordpress.com. And then since I got my own website, agoodgoodbye.com, all of those blog posts redirect to a good goodbye, but I have to pay them $13 every year to keep the redirect going. So if you're just getting started with blogging your book, start your own website, go to Loretta's class, learn how to get your own website set up, and blog your book. Now the thing about blogging your book, it's wonderful, it builds online visibility for you, your authority. And in the process, you can also build a fan base of people reading your stuff, especially when you tie your blogs to social media. Do you want to add anything about this at this point? No. No? Thank you. Social media, yes. Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, Pinterest, Instagram, on and on and on. What I would recommend when it comes to social media is focus on one or two of them to really pour your efforts into building up followers and uh, your authority. Now, what you might put on Facebook is perhaps more personal than what you would put on LinkedIn, which is more for business networking. Twitter, well, we can see how Donald Trump has used Twitter to rock our worlds. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a big Twitter fan. I just, you know, I've got a Twitter account and every time I do a blog post, the notification is basically a tweet with a link back to the blog. YouTube takes a little skill of being able to do video and speak eloquently into the camera and uh, edit it and upload it to your YouTube channel. Pinterest is very interesting. Sometimes, you know, I don't feel like writing a blog post, but there are plenty of death cartoons that show up in the newspaper. I will do a blog post about a death cartoon and if it's one of the, the square ones, rather than the long ones, you can uh, put it on Pinterest with a link back to your website. And I've had people share, especially the Grim Reaper cartoons, that's been very uh, popular. So another way, once you put your stuff out there on the online, you can uh, further extend your reach with social media. And if you're using a WordPress platform, and Loretta will tell you all about different platforms for blogging and your website, is that uh, there's something called Jetpack, where you can connect all of your social media accounts so that when you do a blog post, it just automatically, when you publish it, you get promotion out there in your social media channels. Are we running out of time? <laughs> Oh, okay. <coughs> Offer, uh, you want to build your email list. Why do you want to build your email list? So you can get in touch with people and let them know when your book signings are and your talks and whatever else groovy things are going on. But you don't want to be selling all the time when you sell, send emails to your email list. You want to send them helpful information, which again, would be part of your brand. And then every now and then you throw in a little sales message and people can buy. 
And part of that sign up is to offer an irresistible information product. That could be a report, a tip sheet. In fact, if you're giving me your email for the drawing, you'll also get the 50 point executor checklist from kicking the bucket list, which is a really handy tool to figure out, oh my God, there's all this stuff I need to pull together and didn't realize. So <laughs> it's a helpful guide post for that. But by doing that, you collect people's emails. I'm sure it, at some of the other talks we've heard about the importance of gathering emails so you can keep in touch with your fans. Because then you can find riches in the niches, but it takes time to get established. I'm living proof of that. I've been doing this for six years, and it's only just now starting to pay off. So, but take heart. It can happen if you keep going. And Susan, branding or not? My experience with branding has been interesting. Yes. When I was doing a lot of art, I found out that people really liked my irises. So I did a lot of irises. I was branded by my irises. <coughs> I found a black background really made them stand out. They were very noticeable. I used that as my brand in painting, but I had a mishmash for writing. So what do you do if you cannot find one specific brand for what you do? Because I wrote about art, restaurants, real estate, mold, and football. What? How does that tie together? The last one, please. Oh. I'm just gathering time. I got it. Oh, we got it. Okay. Specialized branding may be necessary. I talked to two experts in branding. One of them said, never come to my group again. <laughs> the other one said, I don't know. Yes. What? Oh, come and get the slip? OK. So I brand depending on what I happen to be talking about, what my particular focus is, and it, it seems to work because everybody knows I'm mold, and I'm football, and pretty soon, hopefully, I will be a novelist. Anything else? Well, questions. Yeah. Answers. <laughs>